title, we've borrowed this search for tomorrow. And we've already told you we're going to talk about heaven. Is it fact or fiction? Is it a worthy ob objective or not, or just a medieval superstition? First of all, men have always believed in an afterlife. They've always believed in heaven. Those who have studied the history of the uh, natural Americans know that the American Indian uh, believed in the happy hunting ground where if he had his favorite bow and arrow and horse, he could enjoy hunting without problems forever. I've had the privilege of going into the tomb of King Tut in Egypt, and I've seen the treasure taken out of that tomb. It included his favorite couch. It included his gods, furniture, chariots, boats, perfumes. And I understand that in that culture, in those days, often the favorite wife and servants would be buried with these important personages. In the Hindu faith, they believe in transmigration of the soul, that human beings come back in higher and lower forms, reincarnated. And so men have always believed in an afterlife. But I'm telling you tonight, only Christians have a real and valid hope. Christians know something about heaven. And the reason they know is that someone who lives there also lived here and through inspiration has told us some things about heaven. I think it's sad when people don't know or don't believe in the coming of our Lord. It was the blessed hope of the church in ages past. And not just the New Testament era either. It was Job, and his book is probably the first book ever written. It was Job who said, I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms have destroyed this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. Ladies and gentlemen, people who trust God have always believed in the afterlife, that something better than this sin-cursed earth is waiting for them if they will only trust in the Lord. I remember reading an article about 22 ministers of the gospel. Now, these were Christian ministers. They were interviewed, and they were asked if they believed in heaven and hell. Do you know that 21 of them said no? They believed, for the most part, that you make your heaven or your hell right here. Well, folks, Pasco is beautiful, but it's not heaven. I want something better than this, don't you? <laughs> and in addition, there's so much ignorance and so many ludicrous ideas concerning heaven that reasonable and thinking people dismiss it as sheer nonsense. And I don't blame them considering some of the things they hear. Uh, many people believe that heaven is somewhere out there and that everybody who lives there is a little disembodied spook who spends all of his time sitting on a cloud playing a harp. I wouldn't want to go to heaven if that's all I did. Now, I like music, but I don't want to play a harp for a billion years, do you? To the exclusion of everything else. And then there are others who believe that there's a gatekeeper up there and his name is St. Peter and that it's according to his whim and fancy whether he lets you in or not. For still others, the whole idea is too ethereal, so unreal, and they're not planning to go. They figure they better do the best they can down here because probably, in their minds, death is the end of it all. And there has arisen today a cry of ridicule and derision toward anyone who believes in heaven. They call it pie in the sky, by and by. Well, my dear ones, is there any reliable information about heaven? The answer again is yes. For someone who lives there once lived here and he has told us something about it. In the model prayer which Jesus himself gave to his disciples, he began with these words, Our Father, which art in heaven. 
You know, sometimes when you don't know quite what to believe, it's always safe to believe what Jesus believed. Don't you agree with that? Our Father which art in heaven. Well, where is that? In 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 2, Paul speaks of being caught up into the third heaven, and he calls it the paradise. Now, if you've got a third of anything, you must of necessity also have a first and a second. Isn't that right? I expected a question, actually, because I was preaching to you the other night, and I mentioned in my sermon, I mentioned in my sermon that the heavens are going to pass away when Jesus comes. And usually someone writes in a question and says, if heaven is going to pass away, then where are the saints going? Well, I'm glad to clear that up tonight, even though you didn't ask. Paul says he was caught up into the third heaven in a vision. Well, then we must consider the first and the second. Three heavens at least. The first heaven is the atmospheric heaven. The Bible speaks of the birds flying in the midst of the heavens. That means the birds that you see out there in the atmosphere. They're not up there where God lives, flying around, not the birds you see. Then secondly, they are the stellar heavens or the starry heavens. The Bible speaks of those stars in the midst of the heavens. And then out beyond there, Somewhere is the heaven of heavens where God's headquarters are located for the entire universe. In 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 10, then we read that when Jesus comes, the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Peter was not talking about heaven where God lives. He was talking about the atmospheric heavens that envelope of oxygen and dust and air, the ozone layer, and all of these things which are peculiarly in our sphere. They are laden with disease. They are laden with all kinds of sinful music and conversation. All you got to do is turn on a little radio and you pull those sounds right out of the air. The earth is venereal with sin. You don't have to eat something to catch a disease. All you have to do is breathe. And the air is made of gases, and they are explosive gases. And the reason we are able to be sustained is the power of God. The Bible says by him all things consist. That means they hang together. And when he's ready to come down here, the balance will be disturbed, and there's going to be a cataclysmic explosion, and the heavens shall pass away with a great noise. And yet there are some who say it's going to be a secret rapture. Incredible. In Revelation chapter 21, Jesus said he's going to make a new heaven and a new earth. And I'm so glad to hear that. But please don't miss the last part. Not just a new heaven, a new earth also. You see, God's original purpose has been temporarily thwarted. But if it were eternally thwarted, then the devil would have defeated God. God's purposes are going to be resumed after sin has run its course. God's going to make a new earth right here. And Jesus said, the meek shall inherit what? The earth, that's right. And God's original plan for man will be carried out and all of us may be there. New heaven and a new earth. Now let's see some things from the Bible concerning the heaven that we want to go to. In John 14, 1 to 3, Jesus said, Let not your hearts be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you. There's another nail in the coffin of that era we exposed last night. Jesus said, I'm coming again. When he comes, he says, I'm coming to receive you. The saints are going with him when he comes. And he said, I've gone to prepare a place for you. So heaven is a place, not a figment of man's imagination. I'm going to prepare a place for you. In Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 16, please write the text down, those who want to look these over, because I don't want to take too much time looking things up and reading them as we got a late start tonight. But in Hebrews 11 and verse 16, the Bible says, He hath prepared for them a city. So it's a place 
and it's a city which the Lord has gone to prepare. And in Hebrews 11 and verse 10, it is called the city of God. Would you say amen, Isaiah? So the Bible gives us now some insight. And like the chamber of commerce, the Bible gives us some of these interesting and thrilling features concerning heaven. In Revelation 21, the Bible says that it's not only a city, but it's a square city. It lies four square. Then the Bible tells us something about the size of it. It tells us that it's uh, 12,000 furlongs. 12,000 furlongs. If you translate that into English, it means there are 1,500 miles you have to travel if you want to go around that city that lies four square where God's throne is. Now, frankly, I enjoy thinking about this. I mean, my appetite is whetted. I hope yours is too. I enjoy thinking about heaven. And the first thing I like to think about is there's plenty good room in my father's kingdom. I, I'm sure I wasn't here, but I'm pretty sure the quartet, my quartet sang this song for you. Plenty good room. You know, down here, most of us never get to uh, own a great deal of property, you know. We are always squeezed out. We are paying rent. Well, let me tell you, up there in that city God has gone to prepare, it is so large, there's plenty good room in my Father's kingdom. If it takes 1,500 miles to encircle the city, that means a square city is 375 miles on each side. Now, any child in school can take a pencil and figure out how many square miles are in heaven. And when you add it all up, you discover there are 140,625 square miles in that city. Now, that's a lot of room. Let me give you some comparisons. The state of Pennsylvania, the whole state, has 45,126 square miles in it. That's the whole state. Then you say, well, what about New Jersey, a smaller state? 8,224 square miles. Then if you add in Maryland, where I live, 12,327 square miles, and then throw in the nation's capital, 70 square miles, you come up with a total, well, let's throw in one more. Let's put in Virginia with 42,627 square miles. When you add Virginia, Pennsylvania, Maryland, New Jersey, and the District of Columbia all together, you get 108,374 square miles. Heaven is 32,251 square miles bigger than all those states in the District of Columbia. I think you ought to say amen out there. Now there are some large states in the South. Florida is a large state land-wide, having 58,560 square miles. And next to Florida is another large state, Georgia, with 58,816 square miles. And when you add those together, when you add all of those together, you come up with a large land territory. But heaven is 23,000 square miles bigger than Georgia and Florida. And one man who was doing a little figuring with his calculator said, it's big enough to hold 39 billion people. There are less than 5 billion people on earth now. I think you would agree, therefore, there's plenty good room in our Father's kingdom. Would you say amen? Not only do we have all that room, but there are a lot of things down here taking up space that we're not going to need in heaven. We're not going to need any cemeteries in heaven. Not going to need any hospitals in heaven taking up space. We're not going to need any penitentiaries and jails in heaven taking up space. We're not going to have a lot of things up there 
that we have down here because the curse of sin will be removed forever. Plenty good room in the Father's kingdom. Not only that, but we're not going to need ranches in heaven because they're not going to kill any cattle and sheep up there. The farm that is needed to feed everybody who is saved is one tree. It's called a tree of life. And the Bible says it bears 12 manna of fruit. And every month a new kind of fruit. And those who eat of it will live forever and cannot die. So you don't need a lot of farm space in heaven. And then you add to that the fact that one river is the water supply. It's called the water of life. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, it's interesting just to think about it. Don't you agree? Now, all cities on earth have their interesting points. If you come to the nation's capital today, you would probably want to see uh, a lot of things. You'd want to see the White House. You'd want to see the Congress, uh, the capital, that is. You would want to see the Smithsonian Institute, and they've got a new airspace museum. Believe me, if you go, you want to see that. You'll want to see Arlington Cemetery, and the newest attraction just dedicated on this past Sabbath was a memorial to the veterans of Vietnam. Every city has its interesting points. When I landed out here and looked around, it's so pretty, I asked the pastor, what are the interesting points here in Pasco? And he told me about an Indian monument or memorial or something like that. Then you got the Columbia River and beautiful bridges crossing over and all that sort of thing. Every city has its points of interest. Well, I want to tell you, heaven is no different. There is a text in the Bible that um, I don't know how to interpret, to be honest with you. We've already read that each wall is 375 miles long and the city lies four square. Now, the Bible says in Revelation 21 and verse 16 that the length and the breadth and the height of the city are equal. Could it mean that there are some skyscrapers up there 375 miles tall? If so, I want an apartment on the top floor. I don't mind telling you that tonight. But I will tell you, I have read books trying to figure out what Bible scholars think that means. And I think the consensus is that it simply means the city is well proportioned. Perfect in its shape, in its size, in its balance, in everything. But then the Bible goes on to tell us in Revelation 21 that there are 12 foundations to the city. The city sits on foundations that are precious stones, tier upon tier of precious stones and altogether they have the appearance of a rainbow you read that in verse 19 of revelation 21 and you know what after you think and think and imagine and imagine the bible says i have not seen nor ear heard neither hath entered the heart of man the things god has gone to prepare for those that love him but then we learn there's a wall around the city and the Bible says that wall is 144 cubits high. In the Bible, a cubit is about 18 inches. And now if a cubit is roughly 18 inches, that means that each wall is roughly 216 feet tall. Now the Bible says those walls are not only 216 feet high, but they are of transparent jasper. Now transparent means you can see through them. You see, my glasses are transparent. Then you've got something like this Bible, which is opaque. You can't see through it. Then you've got something like a piece of paper that allows light to come through. That's translucent. But the walls of the city are transparent. Can you imagine these tall walls? And yet you can see through them. When the holy city comes down to earth and the wicked surrounded, about to be destroyed with flame, they will look through the walls and see what they missed. And one religious writer says, that will probably be the most anguishing part of hell. To realize that they sold out so cheaply. For sheer pleasure, they turn their backs on eternity. For some other foolish reason, holding on to tradition and man-made religion, for some other foolish reason, reason 
They turn their backs on the truth and therefore they cannot enter the city, but they'll be able to stand on the outside and look in. That's hell. To realize they could have been there if they'd only trusted in Jesus and his word. Not only are there walls, but there are gates to the city. And the Bible says gates of pearl. It does not say pearls. One religious writer commenting on that said that each gate is, as it were, carved from one pearl. And there are three on each side. Revelation 21, 12, and 13. Then the Bible says that the streets are made of gold. Oh, I know how this sounds. It's fantastic. That's why I want to go. I want to be up there. I want to be with my mother and my father and my loved ones and with you. But I also want to be with Jesus. And then I want to see the perfection and glory of that beautiful city. Can you imagine streets of solid gold? Now there are three gates on each side. That's 12 gates around. And these gates are connected by streets that form a grid over the entire city. And each street 375 miles long. My dear mother, as she was living her last days, became very weak in her body. But when we all get to heaven, as we sang tonight, there's not going to be any weakness, not going to be any sickness, not going to be any pain, not going to be any sorrow, not going to be any arthritis, not going to be any diabetes, not going to be any heart trouble. And if we want to, we can take off running from one gate to the other and run 375 miles without even breathing hard. I want to be there. I want to see it. I want to experience it. And then the Bible tells us that the throne of God is in the midst of the city. That throne out of which issues the river of the water of life. That throne unapproachable. And God's going to let us gather around that great throne. That river of life, you drink of it and you can never die. The tree of life is there. You eat of it and you can never die. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nation. I don't mean to talk about my mother so much, but she's been on my mind even though she's been gone a long time. In her final sickness, I would write her as often as I possibly could. And in almost every letter, I would quote from this chapter we are quoting from tonight. Revelation 21 and verse 4. It says, and God shall wipe away all tears. Oh, beloved, think of the tears. Someone said if all the tears ever shed because of sin were gathered together, you could float a battleship in the tears. Tears! Hot tears! Some of you right here have shed tears. Some, perhaps, in the dark watches of the night have bathed their pillows in tears. But the Bible says when we get to heaven, God shall wipe away all tears. No more crying. Then that text goes on to say, there'll be no more death, neither sorrow, crying, nor pain. For all of these things are passed away. That's enough to make you want to go. Isn't that right? The Lord has held out the most beautiful incentive so that all who serve him will serve him and then be recompensed by his hand. It's all for you and for me he has prepared it. Well, the Bible tells us that Moses is up there. And on the Mount of Transfiguration, Moses came down. Incidentally, the Bible tells us that the disciples who saw Moses and Elijah were not asleep. Some people say it was a dream or a vision. But it is written in the scripture that they were awake. They were not asleep. Moses and Elijah came down. Do you know how long Moses had been dead and raised? Over 1,500 years when Jesus was in the Mount of Transfiguration. Can you imagine a man 1,500 years old and when he came down, he wasn't all bent over and walking on a stick. He was as he was when he lived. His natural force unabated. He had power and youth and eternity in his bones. And with him came Elijah. You know how long he had been dead? I'm sorry. How long he had been translated? 900 years. One of them. Been gone 1,500 years. The other had been gone 900 years. 
And yet they came down and talked with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. And the disciples saw them. They were not decrepit and all wrinkled out. They were wearing the bloom of eternal youth. That's what heaven holds for us. Then the Bible says, when we get up there, we will not remember the former things. Now, all you've got to do is just think. And you can think of sorrows and heartaches and funerals and wars. You can think of such tragic things that plague your life and take away your laughter. There are some whose husbands are abusive and, and, and they're drunkards and, and they put their fists into the delicate bosoms of the wives. And the wives are so discreet they can't tell anybody. And they just bear it year in and year out. Well, when we get to heaven, that's all over and you won't even be able to remember it. That's what I love. God's going to erase negativism from our mind. The Bible says they won't be remembered. I like that. The scars will be gone. Nothing but joy up there in my father's house, the gospel song says. Oh, beloved, why am I telling you all this? First of all, because it's in the scriptures and Jesus is offering it in love. But secondly, I'm telling you, because it seems to me, if you've never thought of it before, you'll want to go and be where Jesus is. Well, who's going to be there? I'm going to read a couple of these, and then we're going to go to the screen, and we will finish on time. In the book of Revelation, chapter 7, and the ninth verse, this is what the Bible says. Listen, Revelation 7 and verse 9, I read, After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people, and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. So there's going to be a large crowd there. You know, somebody wrote me the other night about the 140 and 4,000. And we don't know all that God intends us to know about the 140 and 4,000 yet because he didn't see fit to put it in here. And then there are some who wonder if that's all that's going to be there. I'm happy to tell you there's going to be a number... And incidentally, that's what he's discussing right here. And he said, after this, after I saw those folk, I saw another crowd, which no man could number, an innumerable host. So many people, you can't even count them. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm not too much concerned about which group I'm in. All I want to do is be there. What about you? Now, maybe it would be the greatest honor of all to be in the 144,000. But I'll take heaven any way I can get it. I just want to be in heaven with Jesus and with loved ones. So those innumerable will be there of every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. You know, nationalism has turned people against each other. And they are hatreds that are palpable. But I can tell you as one who travels around this world that wherever I go and find God's people, I found my own people. I have embraced in the Alta Plana my brothers and sisters, and we couldn't even speak the same language. I remember being in a South American country, and a young high school student followed me out of the classroom. He couldn't understand anything I said, and he made a sign, and he touched me on my chest, and then touched himself and pointed toward heaven and said, we'll be able to understand one another up there. Oh, I said, thank God, yes, we will. And there we stood with our arms around each other, Brothers in Christ Jesus, of every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, of every race under the sun, black men and white men, red men and yellow men and brown men, brothers in God's kingdom together to live together throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity. Who is going to be there? Revelation 22, 14 says, Blessed are they that do his commandments that they may have a right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. Those who go are going to be obedient to God's law. Well, having told you that, let me tell you who's not going to be there. The Bible tells us in the book of Galatians, Galatians, St. Paul writing, and he said in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 19, these words, now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, listen now, adultery, fornication, that's moral uncleanness. 
It's more than violating the marriage vow. It has to do not only with the overt acts of filth, but loving it and reading about it and watching the pictures, these salacious magazines, those whose minds are corrupted. The Bible says adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. I, I, I asked someone one day, what does that word mean? He said, that's old folk who chase after young women. Minds all fouled up. Lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft. Don't miss that when we were talking about it last night. Witchcraft, hatred. You know, the most unreasonable sin of all is hatred. Folk hate folk they don't even know. And hate them for stupid reasons. Hate them for reasons that people can't even help. Hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings. Don't miss that one either. Those who revel are those who got to always be at some party. Always having a big time. The Bible says, and such like of the which I tell you before, as I have told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of heaven. Might as well disabuse our minds of the idea that we can do all these dumb things and go to heaven too. You can't have it both ways. So that's who's not going to be there. In Revelation chapter 21 and verse 27, the Bible says, There shall no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever uh, worketh abomination or maketh a lie. But ladies and gentlemen, I'm so glad to know that Jesus is saving people. Aren't you? He hasn't given up on that. And that's why we are here in Pasco. And one soul is worth more than the whole world. If one person decides they want to be with Jesus and go to heaven with him, that's wonderful. Jesus would have come down and died for one soul. I'm going to ask that the lights go off now and let's conclude our message on the screen as briefly or as quickly as we possibly can. We're talking about heaven tonight, but before we get there, there's a judgment to see who is fit to go. In Romans 2 and verse 3, the Bible says, And thinkest thou this, O man, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Every one of us must give account for the deeds done in our body. And the Bible teaches us in James chapter 2 and verse 12, we're going to be judged by God's law. Would you say amen out there? Now Peter said in 2 Peter 3, the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. So we must begin with the coming of Jesus. That's when the heavens will explode. That's when the earth will be thrown out of her natural order. That's when there will be an earthquake such as never was. That's when some will be running in terror while others are rejoicing to see Jesus come. Which group do you want to be in? I don't want to be scared to see Jesus. I want to be his friend now so that when he comes, I will behold him as a friend. I want to be in that blood-washed army that shall go home to God's kingdom. The Bible says John saw the holy city. Ladies and gentlemen, an artist simply makes a representation. Nobody can paint heaven. If they did their best, it's better than that. You imagine your best. It's better than that. But this is simply a representation. In vision, John saw that beautiful city, four square, with those 216-foot walls of transparent jasper. And inside that city, the, the, the very throne of God. One day, however, God's going to welcome the saints home. It's in the Scriptures. One day, that blood-washed army shall mount the skies, that innumerable host. And they are going home to be with Jesus. And the gates shall be flung open wide. And the saints are going to go marching in. As the old Negro spiritual says, I want to be in that number when the saints go marching in. And Jesus is going to personally welcome his people home. And ladies and gentlemen, it's not far off now. Signs that show his coming near are fast fulfilling year by year. This world can't last much longer. Billy Graham's wife is reported to have said, if the Lord doesn't soon come and put an end to this mess, he will have to apologize for destroying Sodom and Gomorrah. That's how bad it is today. Soon and very soon, we're going home to be with God. These are just representations. 
the streets of gold, the river of water of light, the beautiful mansions God has gone to prepare. God says he wants to welcome us home and we have the privilege of being with Jesus there. But even then, I have not seen nor ear heard. You can't even imagine how wonderful it's going to be. Sometimes when I'm driving along the road by myself, I just sit behind the wheel for long periods of time trying to imagine what it's going to be like not to have another pain or another problem forever. Have you ever thought about that? What's it going to be like never to hear sad news again? Never to have your phone ring at 3 o'clock in the morning and you know when you pick it up there's trouble on the other end. Never have to say goodbye to a loved one again. Never! I'm tired of funerals. I try to imagine what it's going to be like. In the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped, the Bible says. Then shall the lame man leap as in heart, and the tongue of the dumb shall sing, for in the wilderness shall waters break out, and God shall wipe away all tears. Oh, folk, you ought to say amen to that. This world is a world of sorrow, a world of tears. All you have to do is turn on the news, and, and, and it's just trouble everywhere. But God shall wipe away all tears, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain. And the throne of God will be in the midst of the city, and the tree of life with two trunks, one on each side of the river of life, bearing twelve manner of fruit, and those who eat of it shall never die. But then the Lord said, I'm going to create a new heaven and new earth, and they shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat the fruit thereof. In case you didn't get it when I mentioned it earlier, let me tell you now in closing, we're not going to stay up there in heaven forever and ever and ever and ever. Heaven is coming down to earth. You see, God's plan is going to be resumed down here. John said, I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And when we get back down here to earth, we're going to have day and night again. Up in heaven, there's no night. But when the holy city comes down, things will continue as God intended them when he created this world. And there are going to be animals down here. And the Bible says the wolf shall dwell with the lamb. And the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf, and the young lion, and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. I was in a car driving through Kruger National Park. And as long as you keep your windows up, you can drive right amongst the wild animals. And I remember a lion being as close to me, closer than that pulpit desk. And I remember how I felt when I looked into the eyes of that bull lion. Oh, but the day is going to come when a little child can catch a lion by its mane and lead it down the street as a playmate. Oh, God's got wonderful things prepared for his people. Would you say amen out there? And then the Bible says, they shall not hurt nor destroy. Thank God. Today, you don't even want your children out of your sight. Evil men are not just raping women. They're raping little boys. And old folks. I had a loved one in Los Angeles, and her house has so many bars at the windows, it's like being in jail every night. Fear stalks the land. But in God's kingdom, they shall not hurt, not destroy in all my holy mountain. Now look at this. It says in Isaiah 60 and verse 18, Violence shall no more be heard in thy land, wasting nor destruction within thy borders. But thou shalt call thy wall salvation and thy gates praise. If you're behind those walls, salvation. No more violence. No more war. No more anti-nuclear groups. Not going to have to worry about that over there. And then it says there shall be no more curse. Oh, thank God. Jesus has gone to prepare a wonderful place for us. Has indeed. There shall be no more curse. But the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it. And his servants shall serve him, and they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. Now, as we close, beloved, I want to tell you one more time, Jesus is right now making up his number of those who are going to be saved when he comes. Right now. That's what it's all about. Right now. He's sending the truth, and to whosoever will, 
He is saying, come unto me. There's no excuse to be lost. It doesn't make sense to miss this. You know what the alternative is? Hell's fire. Now who would give this up in order to be burned up? So the Lord says, now you can't just come in here uh, the way you were born. You've got to be born again. You can't just come in here with all your old habits. You've got to be cleaned up by the blood of Jesus and then sanctified by his life. You've got to obey me. 